In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today is the seventh Sunday of Easter. You'll notice there's a little difference from our earlier Sundays in the Easter season because the Paschal, or sometimes it's called the Easter candle, is not lit. Uh, over there by the baptismal font, oftentimes it's up there by the altar, but at Ascension you bl keep it uh, unlit because that signifies or, or um, uh, explains how Jesus has gone up into heaven. And now we concern ourselves with the gift that he promised to his disciples and to all, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Next Sunday is Pentecost where we indeed celebrate God's gift of the Holy Spirit. So our gospel text today from John uh, chapter 15 and 16 uh, speaks of two things. First is Jesus' gift of the Holy Spirit to the disciples and uh, to all who believe. And Jesus calls the Holy Spirit here the helper, or as it is often translated, the comforter. He's also called the spirit of truth. Secondly, our text also speaks of the persecution and hatred of the world against all true believers, against the disciples and against you and me. And friends, we have to take this as a given that for Christians we will be hated by the world. All right, so with those two things in mind, God's gift of the Holy Spirit, the fact that the world is going to hate those who have the Holy Spirit. Pay attention carefully. Let's consider those two things and learn to be comforted and helped by the Holy Spirit and be strengthened for the world's hatred. Here's the first verse of our text. When the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. Now, understand these two things just from this brief verse. First, the Holy Spirit is just that. He is spirit. His help is not physical or what you can see with your eyes. It is spiritual. It's unseen. It's eternal. Second, the help of the Holy Spirit is only and strictly ever in connection to the God-man, Jesus Christ. Notice at the end of that verse, Jesus said, He, the Holy Spirit, will bear witness about me. The Holy Spirit doesn't do anything except bring glory and connect people to Jesus Christ, all right? So this means, though, that the Holy Spirit helps and comforts those who are walking by faith in Christ and in the repentance of their sins. You cannot have the Holy Spirit and not be a Christian. Likewise, you cannot be a Christian and not have the Holy Spirit. And it's all a spiritual and internal matter. And the world cannot grasp this. It's flabbergasted by it. It doesn't make sense. The world and those of the world look at physical observable things. And so he looks at the true Christian and scoffs. Ha, huh, this person does not seem to be blessed. He is poor. He is often depressed and anxious. He often has poor health. He goes to a small church. He's no one great or powerful. And this is because the world sees only things in a fleshly way. It despises especially meekness. Contrary to what the world imagines, the comfort of the Holy Spirit then is for those who are afflicted, tormented, distressed, depressed, burdened, and anxious. Does that describe you? Well, then you're in a good place receive the comfort of the Holy Spirit. And this is how his comfort works. His comfort is always in connection with the preached word of God. Again, it always connects people to Christ. But this is, this is how the, the progress works. His comfort and help follows the work of faithful preachers and Christians who remind us that we are poor, miserable sinners who have broken God's holy law and have earned his wrath. Being broken and being reminded that you are a sinner 
is a good thing. Without it, you can't have the comfort of the Holy Spirit. And it's precisely the one who is broken and afflicted and horrified by his or her sin, realizing that he has earned God's wrath, that the Holy Spirit really gets busy and he speaks with the voice of Christ through the preached word and he says, Oh, afflicted sinner, you hate your sin good. Know that God loves you and forgives you your sins for my sake. I have triumphed over your sin on the cross and it cannot harm you. Harm you. So do not fear. I shall be your power and strength to do the holy things that God desires for you to do. Just as I suffered and rose from the dead and ascended into heaven, so shall you. Keep walking by faith in me. So do you see how the Holy Spirit brings his comfort to whom? To the afflicted soul who is tormented by their sins, who desires comfort. And the Holy Spirit says in the voice of Christ, I forgive you your sins. And again, this comfort brings inner spiritual joy and comfort to the believer. Such joy and comfort that it exists through the worst of trials and afflictions. And again, the world will never comprehend this. Because Christian joy and comfort is spiritual and unseen and unlike what people usually seek. Indeed, uh, there is another kind of comfort that exists other than the comfort of the Holy Spirit and help of the Holy Spirit. And you can consider that uh, the comfort that the world offers is something that's preached to you inside your head and outside by actual false prophets. But unlike the comfort of the Holy Spirit, the what the world offers is a false comfort. It's a counterfeit comfort. It doesn't last. And so it is that when the believer has physical comforts, they are boastful and they think they have God's blessing and his Holy Spirit because ultimately the physical comforts that the world offers make you feel great. They make you feel like you have God's blessing. I'm doing well physically, healthy. I've got money in the bank. I have God's blessing. But when these things become scarce, the money runs out or they get sick or their friends abandon them, as happens even to Christians, then unbelievers curse God. May we not be like them who murmur and curse God when things go badly. How many of you have finally obtained something that you longed for, even coveted for, only to find out that once you got it, it did not really satisfy? Maybe it's something as simple as a special holiday. A spouse, even. Good and fine things, but things that don't satisfy the soul. Friends, do not pine for riches and worldly comforts. If they come your way, fine, but do not put your trust in them because the comfort that they offer cannot bring you peace in your soul. And the comfort that they offer is only temporary. It doesn't last. Health breaks down. Spouses die. Money runs out, etc., etc. If you do find yourself with earthly physical riches, learn to be a cheerful giver back to God who gave them to you in the first place. Now, here again is the dilemma. The true believer, the one who is blessed with the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit, the com comforter, finds himself harassed and helpless and afflicted to the point of despair. And you might say to yourself, okay, pastor, you speak of the comforter, the help, helper, the Holy Spirit, but I don't, I don't feel comforted. I don't feel helped. I don't feel joyful. Actually, I feel the opposite, pastor. I feel weak. 
I feel harassed. I feel at the breaking point. I see sin all around me that troubles me, and it only gets worse. And I'm even troubled by my own sin, too. But again, this, friends, is a good place to be. Why? Because the scripture says so. God accepts the one with a broken and contrite heart. He does not despise the one who's broken and afflicted and desires comfort and doesn't necessarily feel it. Not only that, Jesus said, blessed are the meek. And he said, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Perhaps you can say with the psalmist who spoke of the future Christ, the reproaches of you have fallen on me. Perhaps you can feel the world's hatred of you. Again, this is something to rejoice in because all true Christians have felt that and know it. Again, rejoice and be glad. I would draw your attention to John the Baptist, that precious and pious Christian that Jesus said was a truly great believer. What were his comforts? They certainly weren't ones that the world seek after. He had no nice clothes. He wore a scratchy camel's hair, of, uh, a scratchy camel's hair cloak. He didn't have fancy food either, but he ate locusts and wild honey. Not only that, but John was imprisoned and treated most shamefully for doing what God expects Christians to do this day, to be, a f to be faithful to the word of God. John could say in prison, where, where's the comfort? Where's the joy? And so it is today. The world hates the true believer. We just sang about it. And the whole true church, and if it wasn't for Christ, the, the, the world, Satan and the world would devour us, of course. It's becoming increasingly evident that, the, that governments across the world consider the true Christian pests and parasites and pass laws to try to get rid of us or at least to shut us up. And we languish in literal prisons and metaphorical prisons the world over. And the false church, which is easily apparently uh, seen here today in, in America, the, this, this liberal church that can't even get uh, uh, gender distinctions even halfways uh, right, uh, this kind of church has allowed all the freedoms you can imagine by human government, and they, they persecute and denounce us, the true Christian, as heretics. They think they're doing something good and God-pleasing when they try to keep us quiet. Why, why do people hate the true Christian church so much? And the answer is easy, really. It's because the church, you and me, the true Christian, testify to the sinfulness of the world. The world is uncomfortable with us. We act like a mirror of God's holy light and it exposes sin. And the church, you and me, testify to the false comfort of the world. We don't even have to say in it. And they understand they're following a false God and false comfort. But again, consider Christ saying to you, don't pay attention to the world's raging at you and my church. Cling to my word and believe. I have accomplished all things for your salvation. Don't be envious of the world and the comforts that it offers. The world's comforts are short-lived but my comfort is eternal and it brings true peace and joy. I will take care of your needs. 
your sufferings and trials will soon be over. Your enemies will soon be called to account. Only trust in me. So again, let's be careful to distinguish the comfort that the world offers, which is something physical, and the comfort of the Holy Spirit, which is spiritual. The world's comfort can be seen with the eyes. It's easily observable. The Holy Spirit's comfort is spiritual. It's unseen, and it comes through the preached word. common, ordinary people like me. It's not fantastic. It's not miraculous. But again, it's because the Holy Spirit's work is unseen through the simple pre preached word. But it's a, it's a great uh, comfort. Just because it's unseen doesn't mean it's not real. It's, it's something beautiful and wonderful. And it's all focused again on the Forgiveness of sins won by Christ on the cross. Now, I want to take a step back with you here to, uh, ex to speak with you about how the Holy Spirit's comfort is through the gospel and not the law. This is a little different uh, thing than speaking of, of the world's comfort versus the Holy Sp Spirit's comfort, okay? It's, it's the Holy Spirit works through the gospel and not through the law. Let me explain myself here. When you feel, for example, the scorn and hatred of the world bearing down on you, or when, perhaps at the same time, you, you feel your heart is afflicted and broken because of your sins, you feel bad about them, in, in either case, or in the combined case, you must consider the true comfort of the Holy Spirit, and that's this, that your sins are forgiven. We Lutherans are famous or infamous, according to some, for focusing on the forgiveness of sins. We deal with it right at the beginning of divine service. You confess your sins, you're forgiven. This is the beginning point of the Holy Spirit's comfort. And when you are afflicted then, you must not look to how good you have been to achieve comfort from God. You must not even try harder to be good and holy to assuage your conscience that knows it's sin. You must not consider the Ten Commandments to please God. And, and in this sense, what I'm getting at is the Holy Spirit does not preach the Ten Commandments. Don't misunderstand me here. The law is something good. The Ten Commandments are something good. But don't Turn to them for peace and comfort in the conscience. Don't turn to the commandments and say, these are God's commandments. All I got to do is try harder. Then I'll be comforted in my soul. The law always accuses. It always says you have not done what God expects. You're always going to fall short when you consider the commandments. And so my point is this, do not grieve the work of the Holy Spirit when you are afflicted and overwhelmed by sin, by clinging to the law or your own righteousness or how good you have been or how good you ought to be and how you ought to try harder. Rather, cling to the gospel and the free forgiveness of sins that was won for you when Christ died and rose again. That is the comfort of the Holy Spirit, the forgiveness of sins. You want the comfort of the Holy Spirit? Then be willing to say to yourself, God forgives me my sins, hallelujah. And when your heart is at rest, knowing that God loves you and has forgiven you your sin, and the Holy Spirit is comforting you with this knowledge of Christ's death and resurrection and, and God's love for you again, and uh, then you can consider the law and how you ought to live. And this is difficult to do. It's, it's impossible without God's help because our corrupt hearts are always looking for comfort in the wrong places, and we ultimately are always looking to the law rather than to the gospel for comfort. All right, so consider then what we've looked at today. The comfort of the Holy Spirit is not the comfort that the world offers, the world's comfort is physical. The comfort of the Holy Spirit is spiritual, and it's found in the forgiveness of sins. The world's comfort 
is something that can be seen by the eyes and measured. Not so the comfort of the Holy Spirit. The, also, the world will rage against you because you testify to its sin. But do not shrink back. Remember scripture. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And lastly, when you are afflicted by your sins, consider the gospel and the free forgiveness of sins to be received by faith. Don't look to the obedience uh, of the law. It will never work. It will only drive you to despair or conscience. Amen. The peace of God that transcends all understanding. Guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Please stand for the offertory.